All right, so good afternoon and welcome to the final College of Liberal Arts Faculty Colloquium of the fall 2021 semester. My name is Quentin Maynard and I'm going to be the moderator for today's talk, as well as the talks that we're going to have next semester. Before I turn things over to Dr. Soderberg, I'd like to make just a few comments. Uh, we're going to try and stream this live to Facebook and we're also recording this session. It'll be available on YouTube after like, sometime next week, I'm going to assume. Um, if you have any questions for the speaker, please type them in the chat box. There's two different spots. There's the chat and the Q&A. I will keep track of those. And at the end of the session, we will we have some time for Q&A. Um, and if we have any students in the audience who wish to receive extra credit for attending today's talk, please send me a message in the chat stating your name, your professor's name, and the course for which you'd like to receive uh, the extra credit. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Soderberg. Uh, Laura Soderberg is an assistant professor of English. She specializes in race and 19th century U.S. literature. She's here today to talk about her first book, Vicious Infants, Dangerous Childhoods in Antebellum U.S. Literature, which was published this recent or past summer uh, by the University of Massachusetts Press. Dr. Soderberg, the thank screen you. is yours. Thank you. And thank you so much for organizing this. I'd like to start by thanking USI for the kind support of ACLAFTA, which went into making this book possible. Um, I also want to thank all of you for being here. It is a Friday afternoon and it's that time of the semester. So thank you for making time to join a Zoom meeting. I really appreciate you being here. So I've got a PowerPoint to give you a little bit to look at. I'm essentially going to use this talk to tell you a little bit about the research I do in my book, hopefully introduce you to some of the main ideas and give you a sense about the work that I do. So first, it's helpful to start with a little bit of background about the current scholarly understanding of childhood in the 19th century. So for a long time, the key image of the antebellum child was essentially what we see here. It was angelic, a child who was pure, innocent, sometimes died to literally become angelic. So paired with that sense of understanding of the culture of childhood in the antebellum period is the work of scholars like Will McKing and Robin Bernstein, who have noted the deeply entrenched limits of this form of childhood which usually took for granted a white child, most often from a well-off home. Again, see the image here. So to use King's phrase, everyone else is often in scholarship considered a child without a childhood. My book builds on those arguments by arguing that while an enormous range of children, especially children of color, were excluded from that form of childhood, their lives were nevertheless shaped by ideas about age and models of childhood. However, they were often bracketed into forms of childhood that are harder to recognize today because they were so dangerous to the children living them. The book is divided into four chapters covering four types of childhood, the apprentice, the prodigy, the incorrigible, and the Malthusian infant. Each moves between literary depictions of childhood in authors like Harriet Wilson, Herman Melville, William Apis, Susan Paul, and Harriet Beecher Stowe, in institutional records, from prison records to indenture contracts to medical journals. My goal is to show how these modes of childhood disseminated across US culture, affecting how children were represented, but also how they were treated. I'm gonna go into the most depth on figures of prodigy and the incorrigible in this talk, but I'm happy to answer questions about anything else. So I think this work matters for a few reasons. First and foremost, because it promotes it permits a clearer understanding of the lives that were marginalized and racialized children lived. Second, because these children, excuse me, because these childhoods were one of the key tools that authors had for connecting race, reproduction, and nat national futurity. As a result, literary jousting about which children would count as which type of children, which children would be bracketed into which childhood, were also contests over which children were the future generations of the nation and which children just happened to live here. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, learning to recognize a broader range of childhood also gives us better insight into how Black and Native writers imagine their own definitions for what a childhood could be. Uh, these models tend to be easy to overlook 
if the only children scholars are used to reading are the sort of pale, perfect angel form. So before I jump into my two examples, I want to spend a minute on the broader framing and flesh out the links between race, reproduction, and futurity that I mentioned earlier. Essentially, one of the ways I understand childhood is that cultural ideas of childhood are also cultural ideas about collective identity. One quick model for this is biologist Carl Linnaeus's ideas about humanity in the 18th century. I've got a page from him up here. Linnaeus classified most humans into four subspecies based on the four racial subdivisions that were common in Europe at the time. These groups were then distinguished by physical appearance, by geographic location, essentially the familiar idea that group identity is heredity and is passed on seamlessly from one generation to the next. However, Linnaeus also identifies a quite different category of the human that he calls the homo ferris, or what we would now say feral child. The defining notion of the feral child is the idea of a child outside socialization. Accordingly, though, when Linnaeus defines the feral child, he offers a few minor traits, but the bulk of the definition is just a list of the isolated individuals believed to be feral children. That's actually what we're looking at here. So we've got the bear boy, the wolf boy, the sheep boy, etc. In other words, the childhood paired with feral children is so distinctly antisocial that it fundamentally changes how the overall group coheres. It's a group defined by an isolated set of individuals who lived in different times across different parts of Europe. Another way of thinking about it, though, in a more familiar register of childhood, is to turn to Lauren Berland's point that white Americans tend to associate innocence with white childhood, and as a result, collectively exclude ourselves from any guilt about history. Ideas about childhood shaping ideas about collective identity. So all of this may seem pretty abstract, but before the Civil War, there wasn't actually a single codified definition of citizenship in law. The idea that citizenship was definitively birthright only gets enshrined with the 14th Amendment. That means the debates over how ch children were or were not connected to previous generations were also debates with major implications for how people understood the nation and the nation's future. The most extreme example of this pattern comes in the literary and medical figure of the prodigy. So in the very early 19th century, the term prodigy didn't have the specific meaning of a very smart advanced child that it has now. Instead, prodigy was a double-edged term that combined monstrous and miraculous together to name a category of the unpredictable or unprecedented. Um, I have here a sample definition of the term used in a translation of Kicker of Cicero, where we're seeing at the end of the quote, nothing can be a prodigy which is consistent with the nature of things. And that's pretty typical for how the term was used. As a result, it was a word for anything from disability to religious symbols to anything that was believed to have mysterious origins. Prodigy, as I discuss it here, is a tendency to treat Blackness as unpredictable and more pointedly as existing outside of genealogy. So prior to genetic understandings of inheritance, antebellum medical discourse turned to Black infancy as figures through which to construct their theories of heritability, essentially by treating those infants as markers of failed inheritance who are estranged from the normal course of time. This practice in turn contributed to a broader cultural association of Black infancy with medical abnormality and genealogical unpredictability. However, the logic of the prodigy expanded out of medicine and out of childhood to also promote a culture of white writings that tr treat Black subjects more generally as always unexpected arrivals stripped of chronology. And I'll note a couple of terms that I that will come up in quotations here are outdated terms that are now pejorative. So just understand that they're coming. Medical journals of the time and the more literary writings that they inspired often fixated on the image of an unexpected Black birth because for many doctors, complexion was the ultimate proof of paternity. This association of Black infancy with physicians' attempts to study heritability crystallized in a new uh, focus on something called transracial superfoetation. This is a phenomenon where women appeared to have carried simultaneous care, uh, pregnancies by two different racially distinct men. So it's the belief that women could conceive two simultaneous pregnancies, 
give birth to both children, and because the children appear to be racially different from one another, the doctor could then backtrack and assign different parentage as a result. For instance, a letter written in the medical repository, a New York medical journal, offers a tale of a white woman who delivered twins with differing complexions, leading a physician to conclude she had been impregnated both by her white husband and by an unnamed black man. He teases out the mechanics of the situation in some detail, reasoning that, quote, the one egg was accidentally impregnated with the semen of the white man and the other impregnated with the semen of the black man, and therefore one child was white and the other was not. By this account, race, or more precisely the phenotypes or appearances associated with race, is made to act as an early guarantee of parentage, promising to differentiate between the child of a white man and the child of a black man. Paternity, the author suggests, can thus be ind indisputably inscribed in the body. So much as these reports promise to stabilize people's senses of genealogy, they also reiterate the constant threat of broken genealogy, summoning up visions of white women who cross the color line to have multiple sexual partners and threats of black men lurking to ruin white marriages. All of this is a familiar set of racist tropes invoking fears of mixed race families, female desire, black masculinity. And this sensationalism also translates into the clinical tone of some of these reports. So for instance, we have the excitable punctuation of a report which reads, quote, one child was white, the other was evidently half cast. The same difference of color was strikingly evident in the umbilical cords of the infants with an unusual exclamation point. And the journal goes on to note a fairly sensationalist story of a woman who is having an affair with a black man. So collectively projected onto the symbol of the black infant, these fears take on a more particular form of prodigy, marking the limits of what could be recognized as kinship. So the ability to label the racial identity of infants effectively to diagnose a child as black provided physicians with a seemingly unquestionable way to trace inheritance, but in a way that tended to only negate genealogy. Racial phenotype couldn't actually confirm paternity, but it seemed to offer a way to definitively negate it. Beliefs about prodigy gradually worked their way into literature with some very strange, supposedly comic stories of, say, an Irish woman giving birth to a Black child, only to have the physician insist that the child is obviously just white with a very large birthmark, or a particularly monstrous story of a young white medical student stealing a Black infant cadaver to dis dissect at home, only to have the body fall out while he's trying to woo a rich young woman with the effect of a satirical birth that cuts the medical student off from ever getting married. Prodigy even shapes Herman Melville's character Pip in Moby Dick and the ways that the rest of the crew sees him not just as outside of their own kinship, but outside of linear time itself. So in effect, Figures of prodigy were crucial for defining white genealogy by using black infants as a kind of outside boundary. At much the same time, another category of childhood emerged to regulate children who were white, but marginalized because they were poor, children of immigrants, or both, that of the incorrigible juvenile delinquent. So consider the case of unruly childhood from the records of Peter McKeeman, a 10 year old who entered the house as the 400th inmate in 1828. Oh, excuse me, he entered the house, this is the short term for house of refuge, which is what juvenile prisons were called when they were first formed. So after a short biographical information of Peter's birth in Ireland, his relocation to Canada and New York with a sailor father, his eventual habit of stealing coffee and other goods, which is what brought him to the house in the first place, the superintendent writes a series of entries entries on Peter's reformation. So we've got Peter knows considerable for a small boy. Peter proves to be a rather hard boy. Peter is about Peter still. I hardly know what to say about Peter. He affords but little hope. No confidence can be placed in his word. Gets clear of all labor he can by dishonesty. Restless in his disposition, forward in his manners, and on the whole, we have to hold him with a curb bit as to government to keep him in any way tolerable. Peter is about Peter still, 
yet we are sometimes almost induced to give him trial at a distance. Peter is a hard, unruly boy. I feel we will never succeed in his case. Sometimes he starts fair and thinks he will be a good boy, but he soon gets something and away he goes again. So Peter, like many of the boys deemed hardest in the juvenile prison, eventually left by signing on to a sea voyage at the age of 15. He returned in the brig to eventually vanish from the house's records. Instead, what we're left with is this peculiarly hollow language that the superintendent uses to describe his character. First, Peter is knowing, too knowing for a small boy, then hard, and then Peter is about Peter. Then he affords but little hope because he lies so successfully as to demand constant scrutiny. Then we get the line that Peter is still Peter again, followed by a brief account of thinking he might be reformed only to be fooled again. In the light of such entries, the recurrent claim that Peter is about Peter still is less description than they are abdication of description. When past entries struggle to set down what he's like beyond having an interiority, being knowing, and having an interiority that's impossible to penetrate, being hard, such notes don't really mark anything except that time has passed. We're not learning more things about Peter here. So by Peter's 1828 imprisonment, the category of the child prisoner was a pretty new one. The 1820s and 30s saw the first official classification of child criminals as a distinct group, and the earliest institutionalization of these juvenile delinquents into houses of refuge in the US. When you read the records of these prisons together with parenting advice from the day, you find a culture of imagining a potentially criminal childhood, specifically through attention to the limits of the body as a means of reforming or interpreting child character. The creation of the juvenile delinquent justified the warehousing of rising number of children attracted to US cities by immigration and industrialization. So by some counts, children born outside the US represented more than half of the inmates in 1830, about five years after the prison's formation in New York. And by 1850, Irish American kids alone represented slightly more than half of the prison's entire population, whereas only about 28% of the inmates had actually been born in the US. So as such, juvenile delinquency theories hinge on theories of racialization and class judgments about inmates' bodies. However, the language of delinquency also provided affluent white parents with a way to imagine their own kids as fundamentally different. In antebellum writing for parents, children's bodies are consistently presented as the first means for socialization for a non-speaking infant. Uh, Heman Humphrey's 1840 domestic education, for example, promises that bodies code deeper feeling and that a mother, quote, conveys her meaning in tones and looks and smiles and frowns to her darling boy long before it is capable of understanding a single word she utters. And in this way, she begins to mold its character and habits to her wishes. So faces act in the absence of language as a naturalized form of communication allowing access to mold an infant's character and allowing its socialization to begin before it's even physically capable of much social behavior. Lydia Mariah Child's 1831 mother's book seconds this idea of infantile responses to a mother's face and extrapolates a version of the child body that really remains connected to its mother's body even well past birth. So Child claims infants will cry at the sight of their mothers looking unhappy. Uh, she frames the situation as a matter of innate communication and almost physical inheritance of feeling. So she explains that, for instance, a young child, quote, cannot possibly know what the expression means, meaning a mother's expression, but he feels it is something painful. This connection between a family body and a personal feeling is so intense that child returns to an already outdated theory that a mother's emotions could be transmitted to a child through breast milk, declaring that, quote, children have died in convulsions in consequence of nursing a mother while under the influence of violent passions or emotions, end quote. This connection is so visceral, it almost exceeds the category of communication, stages infants as being socialized in a temporary but very literal way through the physical intensity of a maternal bond. This reliance on the body as an instrument to access the inner life of a child relies on two principles. First, there has to be some physical continuity between adult and child, usually supplied by maternal connection. 
And second, the discipline must take place at the level of emotion and inner life, lest the child fail to internalize them. So hence, as a result, corporal punishment was at this time coming to be widely condemned as an outward punishment that would teach only outward obedience. Uh, child, uh, wide, excuse me, child outlines the dangerous possibility of a man who grows up having learned by force to, quote, regulate his outward behavior, end quote, and to project, quote, outward goodness, all without having cleansed his heart and instead is just avoiding punishment through what she calls hypocrisy or concealment. So this risk of some secretly oppositional childhood is higher for some children than others in this model. As these manuals make clear, the danger of the body barring access to a child's character was believed to be far less with one's own biological children than with children of strangers. Uh, in a passage she later recanted, even child who is otherwise a really staunch opponent of corporal punishment makes an exception for children who might join the family as adoptees, servants, or apprentices. She explains that while most children who are properly brought up from the very cradle uh, do not need whipping, she sometimes she does caution that, quote, children are not often thus brought up, and you may have those placed under your care in whom evil feeling has become very strong. In other words, violence for child is reserved for children brought in from outside the household as a means of compensating for the emotional gap between a guardian and a child supposedly estranged from the evil feeling of an improper background. For house officials too, the paranoia that their poor or immigrant charges had secret inner rebellion marked a sense of wider disconnection. Specifically, a legal construct from the early days of delinquency discourse, that of the incorrigible child, frames this isolation as a problem of bodily interpretation. So by the turn of the 19th century, incorrigibility marked a broader penal category, but for antebellum law in particular, being incorrigible was a crime in itself, labeling kids as being beyond correction and therefore subject to essentially imprisonment until they're adults. In practice, under this model, criminalized children defy scrutiny because their bodies have been marked as unreadable, putting them outside of any hope of rejoining society. This incorrigibility can register in circular records like the note that Peter is Peter still, but in other cases, incorrigibility is pronounced more directly. The disciplinary history of Anne McCullister, for instance, suggests frustrated attempts at communication with the delinquent subject. So her biography before entering the prison is nothing especially unusual, petty theft, participation in illegal economies, but essentially Anne bounced between adult prison, the almshouse, and the streets before she ended up in the house of refuge. So if we're looking at one particular entry from early, early in Anne's imprisonment, this is within 12 days of her entering the house. She is at this point 12 years old. So the process of Anne's non-reformation and what interests me about it is the fact that it's a process as it's recorded of trying and failing to find a means of communication. So most pressingly, the records come as an attempt to make Anne's body a point of contact for in herself against her considerable resistance. So in this case, for this example, the interaction comes in three waves, roughly. The first is all about words. At stake are repeated admonitions, pleasant words, and Anne's, quote, total indifference to all that was said to her. Anne does reciprocate in words with a pretty forthright and honest declaration that she's not going to change her behavior. So after talking fails, the superintendent turns to action asserting his authority over her body by, quote, chastising her as a child. This is a euphemism for corporal punishment that emphasizes the body as a source of influence for subjects seen as underdeveloped in reason. Finally, corporal punishment fails, and all that's left is this sort of lack of words, the idea that not a word was spoken, and just the superintendent left to say, that he controls all of Anne's body, puts her in uh, isolation and says, like, I can make you comfortable by giving you blankets. Therefore, you need to keep trying to make me happy. 
I want to pause, though, on this particular moment of failed corporal punishment and suggest that its ability to leave the superintendent, quote, considerably exhausted and thereby just for a second turn the records scrutiny back onto its author represents a crucial disjuncture in the attempted socialization of Anne. What the author encounters in Anne seems to be a body that's not socialized to respond to discipline. Though the superintendent imagines from his experience of bodies that, quote, Anne must have suffered much, she shows none of the signs that would let him interpret her pain. For as he marvels, quote, there was no appearance of a tear or any irregularity in breathing. So unsurprisingly, without Anne's body as a point of contact, her posture towards the house and the superintendent who is left shaken and in need of, as he writes, a few minutes of reflection, really never changes. The very regularity of Anne's breath has itself become an element of her moral deviance. Her, not so much because it reflects any specific vice, but because it marks the superintendent's utter failure to engage anything below the surface of the body. So the lessons that Anne learns at her time in the house and the height of her improvement in fact, lies in constructing a wall between her intentions and her outward comportment, according to the superintendent. At best, Anne's profile presents her having tricked her observers into optimism. So only about two notes out of two dozen show approval of Anne, one noting, quote, she has recently made professions of a religious nature which give us much encouragement, end quote. And another, more ambivalently, observes that she, quote, now and then, evinces a disposition to do well. The case history, however, describes her religious awakening and more general desire to improve as diversions and false signs that ultimately prove useless in predicting Anne's future behavior. In each case, the entry that signals hope is also immediately following up to signal disappointment. Her religion is quickly submerged in, quote, her strong propensity to evil such that she again becomes ugly and tiresome. And the entry that observes her occasional improvement in disposition declares she would, quote, again break forth in wickedness and comments almost passingly that her, quote, last very bad act was in stealing the matron's sweetmeats and plotting to burn the female house, end quote. So where in most cases plans to burn down the prison, which are not unheard of, merit their own entry. In Anne's case, it's such a piece of anecdotal evidence of incorrigibility that it's almost not as important as the broader pattern that argues for incorrigibility. So after this last entry, the record stops for two years, resuming only to recount the aftermath of Anne's departure from the house, as if stymied entirely by her recalcitrance. The record has nothing left to say about Anne. Um, so let's turn to one last example from the House of Refuge, the case of Samuel Slowly. So Samuel was criminalized without actually having committed any criminal acts at all. His father didn't want to support a child and so committed Samuel to care, which is unusually explicit in a record, but also not unheard of. So the first portion of Samuel's stay in the house is accordingly low profile. The first note made under the individual remarks section records an indenture a little less than five months after arrival, suggesting that there was believed to not need to be much change in behavior. The profile takes a sharp turn after this because it reports Samuel's escape from indenture and eventually eventual recapture from police, because the Samuel that returns is distinctly different than the one who has left. The superintendent marvels at the scenes caused by Samuel's arrival because Samuel has escaped his indenture and has been living as a girl in the countryside and comes back distinctly feminine. So the superintendent writes, quote, his appearance was very eccentric, his hair long, his movement much like a female, etc." He states that he left his master, Mr. Mappa, in girl's clothing to avoid detection, served better than a year in the country in the capacity of a girl, came to the city in the same habiliment or outfit. Some, however, judged that he was a morphodite, and whenever he appeared in the street, let his peril be what it may, he was mobbed by boys, etc. So strong was the impression that he was neither male nor female by the remarks of the boys in the yard, that means were taken to ascertain the fact. 
when lo, he was a man, but had practiced foot on female heirs and walk, etc. So much that he still in walk, etc. carries the appearance to this day. So Samuel returns to the house physically changed, but the superintendent is hard pressed to locate the physical nature of the change. The best he can do is list. So we've got hair, movement, walk, but his frequent refrain to the sort of catch all, et cetera, in such a short paragraph suggests difficulty in finding what exactly is signaling to him that Samuel's gender reads as female. So foiled by physical appearance, he turns to just anatomy as the ultimate arbiter of identity. So recasting mob assaults on Samuel, which he also reports as incessantly repeated into some singular moment of discovery building to the, like, this dramatic apostrophe, lo, he was a man. Of course, the physical conclusion was a fairly foregone one. As a former inmate, Samuel's anatomy would have already been known to house officials. However, the insistence on this kind of constant returning to the body to settle what was already an officially settled question as to whether fam Samuel would be treated as male or female appears as an attempt to manage the fact that Samuel's body had also learned to be female so thoroughly that even after the sort of seemingly definitive conclusion, the superintendent just circles right back to the femininity that continues to mystify him. So whether Samuel saw his assumed disguise or whether Samuel saw their assumed disguise as an opportunity to express a gender identity which had to otherwise be hidden or was just strictly a situational survival tactic is not really something we can know. And in some ways it's beside the point here because what's threatening about the incident from the superintendent's perspective is the impossibility of resolving the question. The removal of Samuel's body from social legibility at once marks a belief in Samuel's interiority and an insistence that this privacy is beyond discipline or socialization. The privacy is a fantasy in large part and one that Samuel mainly gets more surveillance out of, but it's a fantasy with a twofold purpose. The same insistence that an infant smiling at its mother proves that it's managed individualism is going to prove that it will grow up to be a socialized child also ensured that the perceived physical differences of incarcerated children could warrant their perpetual ongoing incarceration. So records of children like Samuel and the other children I study in my book help us understand more about the historical lives of children, but they also understand help us understand more about the culture that exiled them and the ways that US cultures of childhood have always been used to wound alongside being used to shelter. So that's crucial if we wanna work on the ways that models of childhood continue to do harm today. And it's also crucial for having a truer sense of what being a child in the US has meant. Thank you so much. All right. So the chat is open if anyone has any questions. Let me see. see no. <clears throat> All right, so we just got one. It's from Amy Motts. It says, hi, Laura, great presentation. Do we see the same thing in literature as well as historical documents? You're muted. Of course. <laughs> hey, Amy, thank you so much. Um, so in large part, yeah, I think it's pretty crucial to my argument that these patterns may might emerge in institutional discourses. So the very like refined expert language of doctors, of prison officials, but they come from literature and they feed back into literature at the same time. So I haven't focused as much on literary examples, but that's also because if we think about um, literary methods for tackling these records, we can sometimes get deeper into them. So for a couple of examples, I haven't talked as much about Moby Dick for Prodigy, but we see the language around Pip as this idea that 
he is fundamentally operating in a different time frame than the rest of the crew on the ship. He's the one black crewmate aboard the whaling vessel, and he's described as being sort of always already outside of time. He's also described as being outside of family in a really devastating way, but essentially in a way that really maps on to medical obsessions about prodigy. There's even an episode where he's abandoned on the ocean and is described as channeling visions from heaven, like someone who can go into a fever and start channeling ancient languages. That's a convergence of medicine and race and timelessness that is drawn straight out of medical journals, even if it went through a few translating filters along the way. I don't know if you see the chat, but she said, wow, thanks. <laughs> All right, another question just came through. I just wanted to let you know, join uh, joining from the University of Arkansas, and this is from Kimberly Jones. Uh, I'm working on a thesis about the sensationalism of crime among Latin American countries and appreciate the added information and history I can incorporate. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, so glad to have you here. I'm from Little Rock, so go hogs. And I think she just responded WPS, and I don't know what that means, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so David O'Neill wrote, thank you for sharing your research with us, Laura. I would understand if you would want to cool off for a little after publishing your book, but do you have plans to build on this project with future work? I definitely think dramatic collapse is part of my future, but um, I'm really part of what was really exciting about this work for me was getting to dive into archival sources and getting to combine some of those with the literary methods we have. And so I have gotten really interested in the problem of how do we read institutional records in a way that doesn't center the institution making those records. So for instance, when I was reading those prison records, it was all about the superintendent's point of view of thinking through how the prison saw the children in the prison. What that doesn't tell us is anything about how the inmates themselves might have read those records. And we actually have a couple of clues towards it. And so hopefully what I'm aiming for my next project to do is to start uncovering some of those other histories of reading that help us get at looking at government records, especially from the perspective of people being surveilled. So we can try and read them in tighter alignment with the people being recorded rather than the people recording. All right, the next comment or question is from Michael Kurtz. It says, thank you, Laura, very informative. I believe the same distinction would apply in Twain's portrayals of Huck Finn versus the proper kids, e.g. Tom, Becky, etc. Uh, of course, we also see it in Dickens novels, really helpful to have the broader framework you offer. Thank you so much. I think Twain's a really interesting example. Because citizenship does get to be enshrined after the Civil War, to some extent you do see an explosion of excitement around mischievous kids, where all of a sudden it's safe to be mischievous because you're not at risk of losing citizenship as, as long as you're white from it. And so you start to see characters like Tom Sawyer being really uh, valorized here. But I do think, you know, like one of the things that gets overlooked is the first way that Huckleberry Finn got banned from schools wasn't for its racism. It was actually because Huck Finn spoke dialectical English and it was seen as improper material for budding young readers. So it, it's a really interesting example. Thanks. All right, and Oana Papeshu Sandu says, thank, thank, not saying, thank you. I can't read apparently. All right, so much relevance, so much relevance for the way children are radicalized in institutions today as well. Are you working on these con, uh, connections in your research? I try and talk about them some in the conclusion of my book. Um, but certainly contemporary issues are really at the core of why I got interested in the first place. One of the key moments for 
me defining my project was, you know, I grew up in the 90s in large part, and I grew up hearing stories about so-called crack babies as relatively common parlance. And roughly about the time I was in grad school was when they were publishing definitive studies that proved that that was not a real thing. Essentially that differential effects from race, from class, from poverty, were what were causing the differential products of kids who were being labeled as this sort of derogatory crack baby term. And so just having that uh, defining moment of, oh, this thing that everyone I've heard talk about as though it were real, even if they were criticizing it for being insulting, there was still an idea of some kind of biological basis to it, is fundamentally cultural, really solidified my interest in how do we use childhood and different categories of childhood to hurt kids and to marginalize kids. And certainly like the case for juvenile delinquency is very much still the case. I worked on this project with records from the New York State, from the New York City juvenile prison. I initially wanted to work on Philly's House of Refuge because I was living in Philadelphia at the time. I couldn't because it's still in operation. And so those records were still held as private. And so I'm pretty constantly struck by pervasive patterns in how we talk about white children versus children of color. All right. And then um, Michael Kearns responded, yes, citizenship angle. Thank you. That's so important. Thanks, Michael. And that is the last comment I see. Let me just read back and make sure I didn't overlook anybody. That would have been rude. I don't see any. All right. Well, if there are no more, um, I'd like to, Dr. Soderberg, thank you so much for this interesting and informative presentation. Everyone else who's come, thank you for being here. I know, like uh, Laura said earlier, it's a Friday afternoon. We're really glad you joined us. Uh, before we conclude, I would like to make an announcement about the spring 2022 series. We're going to continue having the um, the LA Faculty Colloquium on Zoom and are planning on for having four presentations. Uh, we'll begin with the first scheduled um, on January 21st at 3 p.m. The speaker will be Dr. Erska Dobersek, and the title of her presentation is, Is Avoiding Meat Healthy? Um, we hope to have you all join during uh, the spring for each of our presentations, and there will be some marketing materials sent out about that moving forward. Um, and with that, we're done with today's session. Thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you at the next faculty colloquium in the spring. Have a great day and end of the semester. Thank you. Of course. And thank you, Dr. Soderberg.